Hello and welcome. It's 10 a.m. on Friday, the 25th of July. You're tuned in to our mid morning newscast here on Arirang TV. I'm Mark Broom. Let's take a look at what's making the headlines. The two day early voting period for next week's by elections is now underway. The main opposition candidate for a key constituency in Seoul has withdrawn from the running in a move seen as boosting the opposition bloc's chance of victory. A UN human rights agency is urging Japan to guarantee independent investigations of wartime sex slavery and provide a public apology and compensation to the victims. Plus, the wreckage of a missing Algerian passenger plane has been spotted in Mali's desert north. 116 people, including more than 50 French nationals, were on board the flight. But our top story this morning is right here in Korea because early voting has begun for the July 30th by-elections. Those eligible voters who wish to cast their ballot ahead of the actual election day can do so between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. today, Friday and Saturday. The turnout in by-elections is typically pretty low in Korea, but the National Election Commission expects the early voter turnout to reach about 6%. However, officials say it could be a bit higher because 15 parliamentary seats are on the line this time around, which is a record amount, in fact, for a by-election here in Korea. According to election law, as of this Friday, media outlets are now barred from revealing any new public opinion polls on the by-elections. Staying with those elections, two opposition candidates in the July 30th by-elections withdrew on Thursday in a bid to merge the voting blocs of the Liberal voters. Candidate Ki Dong-min of the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy stepped down from the running for Seoul's Dongjakbi constituency. This in order to boost the opposition bloc's chances of winning against a very strong ruling Senate Party candidate, Na Gyeong Won, who will now run against Justice Party candidate, No Hye Chan. In Suwon D constituency, Chun Ho Sun of the Justice Party made way for the New Politics Alliance for Democracy candidate, Park Gwang On, to take on the ruling party's Im Tae Hee. Now, a UN panel is urging Japan to provide a public apology and compensation to the victims of its wartime system of sex slavery. This call comes as two elderly victims continue their mission across the Pacific in the United States to raise awareness about the horrors they faced those decades ago. Our Park Ji Won reports. Two victims of Japan's wartime system of sexual slavery visited the city of Glendale in California this week. It's where a monument dedicated to them and the thousands of other victims, a bronze statue of a young girl dressed in traditional Korean clothing, is set up. Please help us. The victims receive an apology from the Japanese government before we all die. Lee yok says... She was abducted by Japanese soldiers when she was only 15 and sent to a military brothel. To this day, the Japanese government denies its military operated the brothels, despite a huge amount of evidence that shows the military did. The two women, now in their late 80s, spoke out against some Japanese Americans and Japanese officials who want the statue removed. They are saying really inhumane things. Both women will stay in the U.S. for another couple of weeks. They will travel to Virginia and New Jersey and to other monuments set up in memory of all those who suffered under Japan's cruel system of sexual slavery. Meanwhile, a UN panel is urging Japan to provide a public apology and compensation to the victims of its wartime sex slave victims before it's too late. The UN Human Rights Committee said Thursday, after reviewing the records of several countries, it's concerned about the re-victimization of the former sex slavery victims. The panel criticized the Japanese government for continuously denying its responsibility and even defaming the victims, rather than taking the necessary steps to help them. The committee, made up of 18 independent experts, also noted 
that every compensation claim brought by victims has been dismissed. And every call to ask for independent investigation on the sex slavery has been rejected in Japan. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. President Park Geun-hye is expected to sit down with the governor of Tokyo in Seoul on this Friday upon his request. Governor Yoichi Mazujoe is in Seoul on a three-day trip aimed at thawing the very frosty ties between Korea and Japan through what he called city-to-city -city diplomacy. Bilateral relations remain incredibly tense and uh, not at a low ebb amid historical and territorial differences between the two countries. Today's meeting will in fact be the first one-on-one -on -one between President Park and a Japanese politician since she took office early last year. The Korean president has yet to meet alone with Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who reportedly told the Tokyo governor before he left for Seoul about his desire to improve relations with Korea. Now, South Korea's small and mid-sized businesses are considering investing in a new economic free trade zone in North Korea. They're hoping to build another joint industrial complex like the one that's already in the north, in Kaesong, but they are setting their sights further north. Our Ji Myung Gil reports. The Korea Federation of Small and Medium Business announced Thursday that it's considering building an industrial complex in North Korea's Najin Sombong free trade economic regions. Federation Chairman Kim ki moon said at a policy forum in China on Thursday that at the request of Korea's small and medium-sized firms, the group is currently reviewing plans. The new complex will likely be similar to the inter-Korean industrial park located in Kaesong, which currently stands as the prototype for economic integration between the two Koreas and a symbol of possible reunification. Chairman Kim said the project, dubbed the Second Kaesong Industrial Complex, is looking to build on 3.3 million square meters of land at a suitable location near the Najin Sombong development regions, since it is close to the borders of China and Russia. The Business Federation says it plans on making a trip to North Korea in the near future to meet with officials and discuss further ideas on investment and developments for a potential deal. News. Get connected to Korea and the world. Join us every weekday for the latest developments out of Korea, Asia, and beyond. On air, on your mobile, and online, we lead the way every day. Arirang News. To try and resolve the crisis in Ukraine, the European Union also offers 50. Now, beginning this Friday, today, the first payout under Korea's new basic pension program rolls out following a series of disputes over who is eligible. The National Pension Service says senior citizens over the age of 65 in the lowest 70 percent income bracket will receive a monthly allowance ranging between 100,000 to 200,000 won. That's roughly 96 to 194 U.S. dollars. Among the 4.1 million people who can claim, 93% will receive the full benefit of $194 per person. If they're a married couple, they'll get $310 a month. Around 23,000 senior citizens will not be eligible because they are either supported by their children, own country club memberships and or luxury automobiles. Korea's new economic team, led by the new finance minister, Che gang hwan unveiled a $40 billion stimulus plan on Thursday. This in the hope of breathing fresh life into the sputtering economy here in Korea. The finance ministry will also slap taxes on corporate cash reserves to coax companies into spending more. Ah Hwang Jae reports. Korea's new economic team is all geared up to shake the country out of its low growth rut. Finance Minister Choi Kyung Hwan said Thursday that the government will seek aggressive fiscal policies that will boost spending by some 12 trillion won or roughly 11 billion U.S. dollars in the second half of this year. The government will also set aside around 28 billion dollars in loans and funds to promote corporate activities. 
to solve structural problems the economy is now facing and to maintain fiscal balance in the long term, it's critical to seek expansionary fiscal and monetary policies, even at the risk of running a short-term fiscal deficit. Che says the earnings of local exporters are not flowing into households, which is stifling domestic demand. To address the issue, the government laid out plans to provide tax incentives to companies that raise wages and increase dividend payments. Korean companies' dividend payout ratio is the lowest among OECD nations. That's affecting the local capital market and keeping corporate earnings from flowing into households. The government, on the other hand, will tax companies that shy away from investment wage increases or dividend payments in favor of hanging on to excessive cash reserves. The government also plans to accelerate regulatory reforms, especially those linked to bolstering the nation's real estate market by giving home buyers easier access to mortgage loans. The set of measures is based on the new economic team's revised growth outlook for this year. It cut its growth forecast to 3.7 percent, down 0.4 percentage points from an earlier projection. The government says that the key to getting the economy back in a full recovery phase is boosting domestic demand, which was hit hard by the ferry tragedy in April. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Now, staying on with efforts to give the economy a kickstart, President Park Geun-hye has made reviving the local economy her key agenda item for the second half of this year. And she's particularly focused on one thing, a method that doesn't cost any extra money, really, that is slashing unnecessary red tape. Uh, Choi Yusun reports. During Thursday's economic ministerial meeting, President Park highlighted the need to cut through red tape that has been deterring domestic investment. The president said a task force should be established to remove unnecessary regulations to create jobs, specifically in medicine, tourism, and finance. Referring to a delay in removing a mandatory electronic identity verification for online transactions, President Park urged officials not to be confined to the Korean market, but to look beyond its borders and come up with a simpler online transaction system for foreign consumers. Positively assessing the government's measures to spur domestic demand, the president said corporate achievements should lead to an increase in household income. On public sector reforms, President Park talked about removing each organization's excessive functions to bring down their debt. And with national safety one of the government's top priorities since the ferry tragedy, the president asked her economic advisors to prepare a plan to foster safety-related industries. 이것도 하나의 시장이고 수요가 여기에서 창출이 된다 이런 방식으로 접근을 할때 안전도 지켜지고 또 그것도 하나의 경제의 보탬이 되는 방향으로 나갈 수 있지 않을까 이렇게 생각을 하고 있습니다. As for a new economic team, the president asked ministers to unite in coordinating their policies to improve the livelihood of the Korean people. Choi Yusun, Arirang News. Now, moving on to some financial news now. And Korea's SK Hynix, which is the world's second biggest memory chip maker, says its second quarter net profit tumbled nearly 30% from a year ago on falling memory chip prices. Our Connie Lee has this report. It was the first drop in quarterly profit in two years. Korea's SK Hynix, the world's second biggest memory chip maker, said Thursday that its second quarter net profit fell nearly 30 percent from a year ago. Their net profit came to about 674 billion won, or about 658 million U.S. dollars. The company blames a drop on its corporate bonds or irregular expenses arising from its past bond issues. Its operating profit, which does not take into account these irregular expenses, fell less than 3 percent, signaling the recent net profit fall as an exception. Analysts say good market conditions and increasing demand for memory chips will help the company in the next quarter and in the long run. 
The decline in the net profit is an exceptional case. The company's third quarter earnings are expected to improve in light of new products planned by mobile manufacturers and the growing demand for personal computers. New mobile products like the highly anticipated iPhone 6 from Apple, a major SK Hynix client, is just one example. Both the company and analysts see a firm market demand and expect a much better performance in the coming quarter. Connie Lee, Arirang News. Time now for a look through the international headlines we're following on this Friday morning. For that, we turn to our Eunice Kim standing by at the News Centre. Good morning, Eunice. Good morning, Mark. Now, some conflicting information we're getting out of Mali in Africa on the whereabouts of the Algerian passenger jet that went missing last night, along with the 116 people on board. That's right, Mark. Officials from Burkina Faso, the West African country that flight flew out of, has been seen telling local media that they have discovered wreckage from that passenger plane. But the owner of Flight 5017, Spain Swift Air, says they have no confirmation yet on a location. Now, General Gilbert Diender, he's a member of the crisis unit dispatched to search for the plane, said the plane was found in Mali territory. Some 140 kilometers north of the Burkina Faso city of Jibo. Now, he told local TV that the team spotted pieces of the plane completely burnt out, scattered on the ground, as well as the remains of dead bodies. He said they did not find any survivors as darkness was falling on the region. But Swift Air said it has not received confirmation of a location and remains in contact with international search teams. Two French fighter jets and UN helicopters have been scouring northern Mali for the jetliner. It fell off of radar contact less than an hour into its flight and is feared to have crashed somewhere over the Sahara amid bad weather. On board were more than 50 French along with 27 Burkina Faso nationals and passengers from a dozen other countries. Two military aircraft carrying 74 more caskets have arrived at Eindhoven military base in the Netherlands Thursday. It came one day after the first 40 remains of the victims of Flight 17 landed to a military honor guard and transported for forensic identification. This as human remains continue to be found in the crash zone a full week after the plane was presumably shot down by pro-Russian rebels. Australian and Dutch diplomats joined to push a plan that would have a UN team to secure that crash site, which has been controlled by the pro-Russian rebels. All 298 people aboard Malaysia Airlines Flight 17 were killed, most of them Dutch citizens, when that plane was shot down on July 17. And at least 15 people are dead after Israeli forces shelled a U.N. school being used as a shelter for Palestinians in Gaza. Pools of blood were spotted in the school's courtyard. Among them were, uh, rather, among the dead were U.N. staff. It was the fourth time in four days that a U.N. facility had been hit. The Israeli Defense Forces said it was reviewing the incident and explained that it had been engaged with combat with Hamas terrorists in the area of Beit Hanun who were hiding arms and fighters in civilian areas. United Nations officials say more than 100,000 Gazans have sought refuge at its facilities. Officials say more than 797 Palestinians and 33 Israelis have been killed in the past 16 days of fighting. And one day after it cut the economic outlook for the U.S. economy, the International Monetary Fund has slashed its global growth forecast for 2014 as well. It said the world economy should expand by 3.4 percent this year, down three-tenths of a percent from its April forecast. The lending organization cited weaker growth in the U.S., China and several key emerging markets for this move. In its quarterly update, the fund said global growth could be weaker 
for longer, given the lack of robust momentum in advanced economies, despite very low interest rates and the easing of other breaks to the recovery. It urgently called for both advanced and emerging market governments to adapt structural reforms that would make their economies more competitive. And TGI Friday, everyone, as we kick things off with domestic football as the KFA completed their first step in their rebuilding process by hiring a new technical committee director. And his 55-year-old Lee yong Su was actually the technical committee director back during the 2002 Korea-Japan World Cup. But after 12 years, Lee, who was also a television analyst, will use his previous experience to rebuild the South Korean national football team. And his first challenge will be selecting a new head coach for the national team. And now staying with football, quite a treat for all the football fans here in Korea as the 2014 K-League All-Star Game will take place later tonight. And, of course, they'll also be able to catch several legends at the game as well. Now with the K-League All-Star Game taking place at the Seoul World Cup Stadium, it'll be the K-League All-Stars taking on Team Park Ji-sung as the former national team captain will play for one last time in front of his fans. And while another legend in Eon Kyo will play alongside Park Ji Sung for one final time, legendary head coach Gus Hiddink will be on hand to coach Team Park Ji Sung as well. Meanwhile, the All Star game will kick off at 8 p.m. And now moving over to Formula One racing, where it seems like the Korean Grand Prix returning to the 2015 F1 schedule is in doubt after another nation is set to return. With Mexico signing a new deal that will have them host the Mexico Grand Prix for the first time in 23 years starting 2015, this leaves the Korean Grand Prix in doubt for the 2015 Formula One season. But also with three to five more nations possibly joining next season, this leaves Korea out of contention with the kind of financial setbacks they suffered from 2010 to 2013. And speaking of speed, we shift over to the South Korean speed skating team as the ISU announced that they have hired a new head coach to lead the team. And why not hire a coach from a nation that's known for speed skating, right? Well, now they have Eric Bauman from the Netherlands to coach the South Korean national team after the ISU announced that they've hired the former Dutch junior team head coach. Now, he's been named the top five best speed skating coach in the Netherlands for the past five straight years and led the junior nationals team to eight gold medals and 21 medals overall during the World Juniors Championships this past March. And now finishing things off with some Thursday night KBO action. The LG Twins win one over the Kia Tigers 6-2 with the SK Wyverns shutting out the Tucson Bears 7-0. And the Samsung Lions crush the Lotte Giants 17-1. Meanwhile, let's take a look at the NC Dinos take on the Hanwha Eagles. Now right off the bat, the first inning, Na Sung Bong with an RBI double to right center gives the NC Dinos the 1-0 lead before Kwon Dong makes it 2-0 with an RBI double of his own. But it's this play here, Mo Chang-min at bat with a three-run shot, capping a five-run first inning for the NC Dinos. But wait a minute, bottom of the inning, red-hot Kim Tae-won, a three-run shot of his own, makes it 5-3 to three here, before Chen jin Heng at bat adds this solo shot to make it 5-4 to four after the first inning. And what looked to be a close game all throughout, NC just absolutely kills it on the offense, scoring 23 runs off of Hanwha pitching as he win big 23-9. to And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Good morning, I'm Lee Ji-yeon with your weather update. Well, on and off heavy rain continues throughout the day. And as we can see, in the upper parts of the peninsula will receive 20 to 60 millimeters of precipitation, whereas down south, we'll see 5 to 40 millimeters of monsoon rain 
today. So as we just saw, a monsoon front will bring up more heavy rain, especially to up north into tomorrow. So you might want to keep your rain gears with you till tomorrow. So clouds and rain will be the main theme today, and it should be slightly cooler than yesterday across the region. So let's take a closer look at those numbers. The high in Seoul and Busan will rise to 29, while Daegu and Gwangju should see highs of 32 and 31 respectively. And for other regions, it looks like Jeju Island should see a high of 32, Daejeon will peak at 31, and Dukdo and Mount Kungang should top out at 28 and 20 this afternoon. Well, I'm sure some of you or many of you are getting tired of monsoon rain now. Well, it seems like monsoon season for here in the upper areas will end tomorrow afternoon. So till then, uh, it could rain heavily. So keep that in mind. And that's all for Korea. And here's the international weather for viewers around the world. And that's all we have for now. We'll be back again at noon Korea time. Until then, goodbye.